Tak dámy a pánové, Jiří Šenčura. <laughs> Děkuji za velmi milý úvod. <laughs> Um, okay, if, if English is better, then I will talk in English. But I have slides in Czech because I was too lazy to do it in English. What so, is in English? yeah, the title is in English. <laughs> and now what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we will be talking about the, the most common mistakes in in tasks and especially in asynchronous code because um, it can pretty badly affect the scalability or the performance of the application. So I will start first with um, why would you like to have something asynchronous in your application? And basically you might look at it uh, in two different ways. The first one is that you want to offload something to a different thread basically. So your UI thread can be responsive and react to users' clicks and minimize, maximize, whatever. The other one uh, is concurrency. So if you are not blocking your execution thread, you can do more operations together and you don't have to uh, start more threads because threads are expensive. Uh, but probably the most important one is scalability. So you are not wasting uh, the resources, which means you can process, if we will be talking about requests per second, you can do more requests per second, or you can handle the same load on a smaller machines, which definitely makes sense, so let's say in, in Azure or in cloud, because you can have a smaller, smaller VM, smaller uh, app service or something like that. Um, the asynchronous operations or asynchronous processing is, n is not something new. Uh, it has been in, in .NET forever, more or less. Um, and maybe you have seen the begin something and end something methods when you are looking at, at the IntelliSense. So for instance, if you open the file stream or in the stream in general, you can find begin read, end read, uh, and so on. And this is something that was called asynchronous programming model. Uh, and uh, that's basically the only one uh, that exists uh, in the underlying infrastructure. The async innovate is only building on top of that. And it's building on, on top of that uh, for a reason. The reason is that the begin and end something methods are really, really difficult uh, to make correct because it's working based on callbacks. It's the same in Win32 API. If you look at the Win32 API, you can find a bunch of methods for reading a file, writing something to a file, and you can find overloads that's, that's taking uh, a parameter to a structure that's called overlapped uh, because the operations inside the windows are called overlapped operations, not, not asynchronous or something. Uh, the problem is that once you have callbacks, you have callbacks everywhere. And probably somebody who ever developed in JavaScript knows this better than I do. Uh, but you will end up in a callback hell. Once you start with callbacks, you cannot, uh, you cannot stop. It will be callbacks from top down or bottom up, depending how you look at it, how we look at the code. So the, the async await in, in C# -sharp is about uh, easily combining all these asynchronous operations together so you can actually read the code line by line and not think about, okay, this piece of code is actually a callback, so it will be executed later. So I will put it somewhere in my, in my, in my brain and then I can read uh, the remaining lines and then jump back when the callback is executed. So that's the reason why async innovate exists. Uh, it's not something new. Even if you look at a call stack of async innovate methods, you will find that the, the, the bottom of the call stack is actually the same as with the begin and end methods. It's, it's exactly, exactly the same. So that's the reason why you want it. You want scalability, you want better resource management, and it's basically combining the callbacks of the stuff. Uh, this is a simple code, uh, basically, it's a, it's a method that loads something from the network uh, and you can find a bunch of these in, in every code base. So basically you have a loop, it might be by ID or it might be some list of files you want to fetch from the internet or whatever. So you will just call some method, I'm using something dot load from network, doesn't really matter. I will put the, the result into the list and then I will return the list. And obviously you will sooner or later realize that this code is kind of slow. So let's say that the request takes 100 milliseconds, you have five of these requests, so 500 milliseconds is uh, the complete time uh, for this method. And if, if you look at the 
graph or or something, I don't know, picture, uh, it might look like this. So you have a, a request coming in, then you have 500 millisecond uh, operations, and then you get a response, maybe it's some processing or something. So we'll say, okay, this is slow. If, if it's not five, if it's 50 elements, uh, it will be way, way slower. So I need to somehow make it faster. And, and when we are talking about making something faster today, uh, it's always about parallel. So you will do more requests in parallel, you will fetch more data in parallel, and hopefully it will be faster. As it turns out, it's not going to be that much faster uh, because the original code, if I go back, is using the for loop. So I can just use the parallel for and parallelize it. Uh, the problem is that, let's say, my machine has two CPUs. Uh, it will be executed in, in two like, threads. Uh, I will get the response in 300 milliseconds because I have five operations and, well, I cannot divide it to 250, so the one thread will have more work. So it's 300 milliseconds. And if you think about it, you will realize, okay, well, it's faster, uh, but how is this going to scale? Well, it's going to scale if I have more CPUs. If I have more CPUs, I will have more threads. If I have more threads, I will process it faster. So if I have five threads, or let's say six CPUs, I will have six threads. So I will process it in 100 milliseconds because there will be uh, one work per thread. The problem is, you are scaling based on the number of CPUs. So the more CPUs you have, the more network requests you can, you can process, which is kind of weird, right? Because you are processing something from network, you are fetching something from the network, and you are inherently bound by the CPUs or threads, which is kind of like, shouldn't I be worried about the network latency, network throughput, something like that, not, not my CPU, because the CPU is really not that much interested in, in network operation. And the problem is that if you look at a, the methods uh, like we had before, like a one big black box, it really is one big black box. But in, in fact, inside, it's like something that you do with your CPU. That's the, that's the beginning, the, the dark spot at the beginning. Then you have like void, nothing is happening. You're waiting for the response to come back. And then you process the response that's the dark spot at the, at the, at the, at the, at the bottom. Uh, but the light spot is like, yeah, I can do whatever I want because I'm just waiting for the remote server to, to respond. So I can actually do it this way. I can start all five requests, then kind of wait or do whatever I want and get the, then get the request back. It might be in a different order. There might be a slight delay or something because the network was not cooperating. Uh, but I will get the response back in in my case, more or less 100 milliseconds, basically the longest one. And it doesn't matter how much of these requests I'm, I'm issuing, because I will issue the request as, as fast as I can, and then I'm waiting. And I, I'm basically waiting for the remote server to process the stuff and the network, if there's some data coming back, probably it is, um, I'm waiting for the data. So I'm bound by the speed of the remote server, which makes sense because it's, it's remote request. And I'm obviously bound on the speed of my, my network. So it might be the latency, or if I'm getting some significant amount of data back, uh, then it's the, the throughput of my network. So it might be, okay, I can do five, 10, maybe 50, but then suddenly my network uh, begins to be the bottleneck, which makes sense because why would the CPU be the bottleneck? It's the network. So the answer is if you are using something that's CPU bound, basically something that is using the CPU, you can use the parallel for task run, whatever, something that's basically taking a delegate and running the delegate. If you are, if you're having something that's IO bound, you need to use the async and I mean the real async code. Um, in the next section, I will check a bunch of options, how not to create an asynchronous code from synchronous code. Uh, but if you have really, really correct asynchronous code, uh, there's no threat and you don't need to worry about creating threads or uh, thread pool starvation and all this stuff. So let's begin with how the async works and how it runs. So there's a, there are two major uh, misconceptions about async. And the first one is that the, the async uh, method runs uh, on some kind of magical thread in background. Is that true or false? No, it's false. There is no thread uh, in the background. It's just nothing. There's no thread, and I will show you a piece of code that basically processes as much request as possible, 
and no threads are taken from, from a thread pool or something. Which is the second point. Uh, is it using some threads from thread pool? No, the thread pool thread is used only for some call, something called IO completion um, port or IO completion callback, which is the callback that's uh, the operating system giving to the higher levels that something is uh, something has finished and you can process the data or something like that. So the answer to both questions is no, there is no thread, there is no thread pool thread being, being uh, taken. Uh, and in fact, the IO operation is actually uh, handled by um, the hardware. You can look at it that for the hardware, it's maybe CPU bound operation, but for you it's IO bound because it's a different CPU that's processing your request. If you take the hard drive, uh, flip it over, there'll be some green, probably green board with a lot of chips and the chips are processing your request. Not you, your CPU has no idea how to talk uh, to the hard drive. It's just sending requests um, to, the, to the hardware and like write this data, the data is there and that's it. So, the first one, the first misconception, the first mistake. Um, if, I, if I do LA task and task that way, is it the same? No, it's not the same. And in fact, if you do task wait, uh, it's pretty, pretty bad because uh, the wait means you're blocking the thread and blocking the thread means that the thread pool will eventually, if it's on thread pool, the thread pool will eventually uh, inject a new thread uh, to prevent, uh, or actually not to prevent, uh, to help the throughput because if one thread is doing nothing, then well, if I create another one and I will be lucky as somebody will be doing something on the thread, then I can keep the CPU, the CPU busy. The F8, on the other hand, uh, is working on some kind of continuation. So basically, when your code hits the line with the F8, the result is written back to the caller. The caller can do whatever he or she wants, um, do something else, run another request, whatever. And once the request uh, is completed, you will get the callback and you will continue on the, on the place where you left initially. Sometimes it's called also um, coroutines and some languages based on this concept. The C Sharp has it kind of, uh, but it's not like first class stuff um, in the language itself. The other one, uh, and it's maybe not a mistake, it's something like, okay, I want to use the async, but I will first start using it on, on, on the bottom part, probably. Uh, because usually you start from the bottom and you go up. And then you say, okay, well, this is the library that I'm working on. It's kind of like, I don't know, like havit.core or something like that. And once that's done, we will move to the different different stuff. So we will have asynchronous everywhere on the bottom and we will continue using synchronous code on top of that. How to do it? So the first one would be like, okay, I will do call something async.result, which will do the blocking, and I will return the stuff the stuff back. Uh, well, that's not correct. The correct way is if you have the asynchronous code, you need to have it from top to the bottom. You cannot stop at some point, at some place, because you, you will basically defeat um, all the stuff that you have done uh, in the bottom. So the first version of the method has a bunch of problems. The first one is that it's blocking, and the blocking is always bad. The other one, that you are uh, accessing the result property, and if something happens, uh, inside the task, some unhandled exception, uh, the result will throw an exception, but it will throw uh, an exception wrapped in aggregate exception. So whoever is consuming this library needs to know, okay, uh, it might happen that the exception is thrown, but I'm not catching directly the exception, I need to catch the aggregate exception, then unwrap what's inside and, and handle that. So it's not on a first look into the code, it's not clearly visible what's, what's happening or something like that. Uh, the other one is kind of, again, performance optimization. Uh, often you can see what's on the in the first method. So you have something that's, that's known, like a simple operation, or it might be something from cache, and you will just call task.run. So task.run will obviously return the task of int, or in my case int, and you will get the result immediately back because, well, adding two numbers together is absolutely easy. Uh, if you know the result in advance, or you can easily compute it, like subtraction or some, uh, sorry, uh, addition, multiplication, whatever, simple method call. Uh, it's easier to call task dot from result. Because the from result is not actually spinning a new task, 
and starting the computation and the computation you know, in one nanosecond happens and then all the stuff that needs to happen happens uh, back in the continuations and all this stuff. So task from result will basically get you task, it's already in the completed state and you will get uh, the result from, from this method. So it's way, way faster, way, way easier and obviously scales well way better. In fact, you can even make it uh, more interesting uh, if you return the value task. A lot of times uh, you are implementing some API, some interface, and the interface is um, uh, asynchronous, provides asynchronous methods, and if you can change the interface, it makes sense to return the value task uh, because the value task is um, uh, value type, as the name suggests, which means that it's not allocated on the heap uh, but it will be allocated on the stack or passed on the stack back. Uh, so you have less allocations, less GC pressure. And again, if you have a, I don't know, website that's handling, uh, that's handling uh, thousands of requests per second, then uh, probably the allocations are not something that bothers you, but the GC or and the GC uh, delays or GC pauses uh, might eventually be pretty nasty because you will have a lot of tasks that are already completed, already consumed, but are still in the in the memory. Another one kind of related to this uh, because we had the really short operation, really known data and uh, something that you have on the other side is really really long operation. So let's say you have a operation that runs from the beginning to the end of the life of the application. It might be some background processing, maybe cache invalidation or something like that. Uh, even though like cache invalidation could be done uh, differently with a timer or something like that. So uh, <coughs> you will say, well, I will start a new task. And if you look at the overloads in the task, you will find that there's something that's called task creation options. And in task creation options, you will find something that's called long running. Just like, mm, I have a long running task uh, or long running operation, and I will create a task with the flag long running. That must be a good thing, right? Well, not really. Because the task creation option long running uh, basically instructs the task scheduler to, instead of using thread pool, use uh, a dedicated thread. And when you evade the task, which might happen in some other places in the code, um, the task is, uh, is destroyed, is disposed. So it's better to use a dedicated thread and uh, inside the thread do what you want because you are basically creating the thread once and using it for, for long time. So all the, uh, the bad stuff you have heard, like creating threads is bad because of memory and all this stuff, is negated by the, the lifespan of the operation. If the, if the operation runs for, I don't know, like three hours because the application runs for three hours, it's fine because you wasted some resources creating the thread, but well, you use the resources for three hours, so it's kind of good to waste something and then use it for three hours. The other one is that if you create a task, the task will actually uh, eventually uh, run somewhere. If it's on a thread pool without the long running, you are blocking the thread pool thread, so it will add new thread. Uh, eventually, if you use the long uh, running, you are creating a thread, but it's not like your thread, it's something that the tasks uh, are managing uh, instead of you, so you don't have uh, exactly what's, uh, you don't have in hand um, the control of the lifetime of the thread and how the thread behaves. So this is a, the code that might be something like a queue processor. So you have a queue, somebody's putting something into the queue, like some producer consumer stuff, and then you have a, in my case, one consumer that's consuming the stuff from, from the queue. And it will say, okay, well, there's a method start processing and I will do task run and call the method process queue. And the process queue is just getting the consuming enumerable from the blocking collection and processing the item, whatever that is. Uh, although this kind of works, it's not the best scenario, especially because you are running the task and you are not storing the value anywhere. You get task run, you task, you're not storing it anywhere. So in case of exception or something, you have no idea what happened. So you will say, okay, well improve it. And the easiest one is create a thread set it is background uh, to true, which means you don't have to worry about stopping the thread uh, or killing the thread or something like that. When the application is, is closing or when the upper pool is restarting or something, all the background threads are 
uh, automatically uh, stopped and destroyed. And uh, I will just call that start, the same process queue, uh, process queue method. And voila, way, way better, way, way easier because if, if I lose the task from the previous one, uh, I have no idea what's happening there. Obviously, if I store it somewhere, somebody can await it. If you await it, then the thread will be eventually destroyed. Uh, so I cannot like reuse it or something. Dedicated thread in this case is way, way better, way easier stuff to do. So the big topic uh, is uh, sync over async or async over sync, uh, depending on where you are. So let's start with sync over async. We have already talked about it uh, with the dot wait, dot result, or something like that, and, and that you shouldn't do that. Uh, this is the reason why. First of, first of all, uh, if you have own asynchronous API, and you are creating sync, synchronous API on top of that, which might something sometimes happen, uh, you will be actually using more resources than if you would provide only the synchronous API. Why? Because if you start a synchronous operation and you are blocking, you are blocking uh, the thread that's executing the operation, and possibly you will be blocking uh, the thread for the callback itself. So you will be wasting two threads, one like forever for the lifetime of the operation, the, the, the extra one for the callback for the lifetime of the callback, uh, which might lead to thread pool starvation. And if you have a synchronization context, so if you are in a, in a win, win forms, WPF, SP.NET, non-core, uh, it might happen that you will have a deadlock. Why? Well, because the, the, the callback would like to run on the synchronization context. And in case of, let's say, WinForms, the synchronization context is actually pushing all the callbacks back into the UI, uh, UI thread. Uh, but if the UI thread is being blocked, well, then the UI thread is saying, well, let me know when this operation is done. And this operation is saying, to the UI thread, well, when you have time, I would like to finish this operation. So there's this tiny, tiny little callback that I would like to execute. Uh, so let me know when you are not busy. So the UI is busy waiting for the operation to finish and the operation uh, is waiting for the UI thread to do the finishing stuff. So you have in kind of a deadlock situation and it's, it, it, it's difficult, especially if you're writing a library. If you're a library author and you say, well, okay, I have this completely asynchronous API and I will add a synchronous because it will be easier, and I will just do dot wait, dot result, or something like that. Uh, then you can introduce the deadlock for somebody because somebody will say, oh, okay, there's a synchronous method, I will call it, I'm in a WinForms or something like that. Boom, the deadlock, and basically sooner or later you will be the one to blame because you created something that's uh, causing a deadlock. So how to actually do uh, synchronous stuff over asynchronous stuff. Any ideas? So you have a library, you have an API, something like that that's fully asynchronous and there is no synchronous version and you would like to do it synchronously. So you either as a library author or you uh, as a developer consuming the library. Any ideas? It's pretty simple, I've already said it. Don't do it. Once you start using something that's asynchronous, you can, uh, you have to use it from the bottom all the way up. There is no way you can stop in the middle. But if that doesn't stop people trying to do it and outsmart the designers, the compiler, the API, and all this stuff. So the first one is, well, okay, well, I will just call task run and call dot result on top of that. Well, that's kind of bad because it, it's, it's blocking the thread that called this method. We know it will be blocking. Um, it's smart because the do async operation was uh, removed from the default scheduler because it's running now on a thread pool. So the, 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 the deadlock is, is gone. But there's still the dot result, which might throw an aggregate exception. Uh, so instead of catching argument exception or something like that, you have to catch an aggregate exception and from the aggregate exception, get the exception that's inside. So you have the blocking and you have the aggregate exception. So that's not the, the one to do it. The other one that's a little bit smarter is using the same task run. Uh, it's going get await or get result. The get result is not wrapping the exceptions in uh, the aggregate exception, but you still have, um, still have the, the blocking. 
So this one is kind of okay-ish, but you, you are still blocking uh, the thread that called this method. So that's not the, the best one to do it. Another one. Well, then let's do the blocking inside the thread pool. And obviously do the blocking outside. Well, you probably know the answer. You are blocking the, the thread pool thread, so you are causing even more damage. And you still have the problem with the dot result on the outside with the aggregate exception and the blocking itself. So this is not the best way to do it either. So building on top of the second one, we can do, okay, we will call get evader, get result inside of the task run, which means you are actually holding onto the thread pool thread, still blocking uh, inside the thread and uh, blocking the calling thread and get evader, get result. You basically just get rid of the aggregate exception. So number five is, well, just call the async operation and call dot result, right? Why would you do it differently with the task run and wrapping and all this stuff? Um, well, you already know why it's bad, because it's blocking. You have the aggregate exception uh, possibility of uh, the dot result. And obviously, the synchronization context, if there is a synchronization context, like in WinForms or something that's using the, the, the dedicated thread for something, like processing the message pump, uh, you will have a deadlock in this case. So, well, building on top of that, again, get the waiter, get the result. No, still the same case. You only assault the aggregate exception. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that you cannot do it correctly. You can even try, like, do async operation, assign it to task, do the wait, get the waiter, get the result, uh, and all this crazy stuff to outsmart the infrastructure. You will not. You cannot do blocking. If you do blocking, you are one way, you are one, one leg um, in hell, and there is no correct way to get out of the blocking. Simple as that. But you might say, well, okay, uh, but I need to call an asynchronous method in a constructor. And I need to do blocking because you cannot have asynchronous constructor. So what's your idea now, you smart? guy or <laughs> something, <laughs> smart ass. Uh, yeah, well, in, in normal uh, constructor, you would say, okay, well, dot result, get, get evader, get result, something like that, because there's no other way. Well, actually, it is. Just use the, the factory pattern. Instead of calling the constructor directly, just have a method that's called, like, create async or something, and inside you can, you can call the asynchronous method. You can use the await. Um, and that's it. Simple as that. Another sometimes used pattern is that uh, instead of the await, you will say, well, I will, I will use a handy method that's called continue with. Uh, the result is more or less the same, uh, and I don't have to use the await for whatever reason. The problem is that the continue with method was introduced in .NET 4 originally with the tasks, while the await was introduced in .NET 4.5 or in the respective C Sharp version. Uh, so although you can create the same um, same ish behaving code, so for example, uh, this one with the evade uh, is more or less the equivalent of the, the one on the top. Uh, the problem is that the synchronization context is not uh, used by continue with. Uh, so the code will actually execute more or less the same way, but it will ignore the synchronization context, uh, which you will pretty quickly find, uh, let's say, in WinForms, because if you have a debugger attached in WinForms, it will throw you an exception. Most of the components will throw you an exception that you are accessing the, the UI from a different thread. Uh, it might be slightly more difficult to debug uh, in, in a web application. And obviously, the continue with um, is not that much readable. You are still in a callback hell as before. It's just a slightly more... Um, readable because you are not handling the, the callbacks with the begin and end. Uh, you get a task, you get the result and all this stuff. Uh, but you still have to think about how the code flows. So if there will be something on this line, you need to think about it. Okay, it will execute sooner than the continue with. Uh, but in here you see, okay, this one, then I will kind of wait, then I will do plus one and I will do another code uh, that's, uh, that's after that. So finally, some more interesting stuff, uh, and that's the task completion source. Sometimes 
you are working with API that was not designed to be to be uh, with a begin end or tasks in the first one. It might be a different library that you are calling into, some native library. It might be some API that's actually kind of asynchronous that you will call some endpoint, it will immediately return you back some token and then you will ask um, the API back with the token, like is it done, is it done or something, something like that. So that's why there's a task completion source. Uh, but there's a, some hidden uh, trap inside it. If you call uh, set completed or try set completed or the same with exception or canceled, uh, the method uh, that's waiting on it will run in line. So if I call um, like set result uh, on some method, so there's something, uh, some operation that's using some events to tell me that it's, it's completed, I will say, okay, set result with the result itself. This method, whatever is behind this method, runs in line. So if you are a library author or um, providing some API, you have no idea who is consuming your code and the, the, the environment it's running in. So instead uh, of calling set result directly, if you create a task completion source, always, always specify run continuations asynchronously. For some reason, it's not default. Um, it's even an option to, to run it synchronously for some reason. Obviously, sometimes it makes sense uh, if you are in the control of the code, but if you're writing a library or if you don't know who is gonna call your API, then you don't know. So always, always use run continuations um, asynchronously. If you don't, obviously it's running in line and you are running still issues, deadlocks, thread pool starvation because you are basically blocking on a thread pool if somebody is blocking on top of you. Uh, and even some uh, broken state in the application because um, some somebody might expect like, okay, this will happen sometime in the future. So I can keep modifying this stuff and suddenly it's there. It's like injected inside the, 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 the running thread. So that's, that's not good. So always use run continuations uh, asynchronously. Very, very important stuff. Cancellation token, something that's really uh, easy to do, but I don't know what, like half of the developers are not bothering with the cancellation token. So the cancellation token itself is a, is a mechanism in .NET how to cancel uh, the operations that are running. Uh, not every operation is cancelable, obviously, like if you have uh, some ongoing network request, you will hardly send, uh, I don't know, like a network packet that will run faster on the wire and, and catch the first one and tell the, the switch, the router on, on, on on the, on the path like to cancel the request itself. So it does not work for everything. But very often people forget to pass the cancellation token. So um, the first one, do async uh, think, uh, I'm calling the read async method. And the read async has an overload that, that takes fourth parameter with the cancellation token. So basically every time you have a asynchronous method, you should pass the cancellation token and your method should have a cancellation token uh, as a last parameter. It might be uh, optional, but it should be there because sooner or later somebody will try to cancel operation or something like that and it will stop in, in the middle, somewhere in the void and well, the developer will not be happy. So always, always pass the cancellation token whenever possible. Uh, yes, you might ask why is the cancellation token optional in the API? Well, it, it's there, so you actually can call the read async without it, uh, because well, sometimes it might make sense, I don't know, probably not, but if, if you are creating API, if you are creating a library, the cancellation token should always be there, even if it's optional, so you might say, well, I will skip on it or something, because you have no idea who is gonna build on top of your API. Um, Another topic, there is a something that's called timer queue. The timer queue is per CPU. It's a normal queue. It's actually a linked list of all the timers you've ever created directly or indirectly. Um, the callback from the timer is run on a thread pool as usual. And the timer is basically a mechanism how to run something either uh, in, in some repeating interval or how to run something uh, once 
after some some delay after some time because the timer can tick just once the problem is that the timer queue is first the linked list so if you're adding something to this list uh, you're adding to a possibly long uh, long link of all the timers and because uh, there might be some uh, some stuff happening from different CPUs there's a lock so the longer the list the longer the lock will be held so the more data more requests you are processing uh, the worse for this uh, algorithm uh, to perform. If you dispose the timer, it will remove it from the timer queue, so the timer queue will begin uh, will be again a little bit shorter. So first one, um, you want to use the cancellation token, uh, well the cancellation token source uh, for some timeouts. So the first method is calling some backend API. And you say, okay, well, I have 10 second timeout. So if the backend is not responding, uh, it will timeout after 10 seconds. So you will create cancellation token source uh, with the 10 seconds. You will pass it into the get async on the HTTP client, uh, and you are done. It compiles, it runs, it times out. Usually, this one you will find when something happens on the backend and the backend is not responding, and the front end or something like that uh, is really, really under load because you will be creating a lot of timers. The cancellation token with the timeout of 10 seconds will create a timer that will trigger after 10 seconds um, and uh, then it will kind of cancel the request or fail the request. But there's another one. If it's not failing and you are processing a lot of requests and the backend API is responding really, really quickly, you are not disposing the timer. So the timer queue is actually growing and the more requests you are processing and the more successfully you are getting something from the API, the longer the time queue is. So the proper way to do it is actually always grab the cancellation token source in the using block and dispose it at the end. So if the get async uh, finishes successfully without timing out, you will dispose uh, the cancellation token source, which means cancel, uh, disposing the timer yourself and your application will not suddenly become slower and slower because of this timer queue. Another from the same category is that you have an API that's uh, not providing the cancellation token, that's not providing you a way to basically time out something. It might be because somebody forgot to put the cancellation token into the argument list. It might be that, okay, this API has no way to time out because it's, it's something, I don't know, uh, you cannot time out. It's just like starting something and either it finishes uh, or, it, or it ends up in, a, in an exception. So the first one, uh, the first uh, version of the code is something that's called timeout task. So you will create a task using the task delay with some timeout. So either the task with the delay finishes first or the other one finishes first. I will call when any and the when any will return me the task that finished because the when any gives you the result when any of the tasks uh, in the argument list finishes. So if, if, it's the, if it's the delay task, then I will throw operation cancel exception or whatever exception I want. Uh, if not, I will just return the task itself because that's the result I have. Again, the same problem. If, if all is going well, I'm creating a lot of timers thanks to the task delay and I'm not disposing these, these timers uh, because everything is running smoothly. It's not timing out. The correct way is again to use cancellation token source. Now I'm not using the timeout in the cancellation token itself. I'm using the timeout task, so the task delay with a cancellation token. And the code is now slightly different. So if, if the task uh, that resulted from when it is the delay task, I would just say, okay, throw uh, operation cancel exception or whatever exception I want. Uh, and I know that the task basically finished, so the timer and everything is, is, is fine. Else I will cancel the waiting because I know uh, my proper task finished first and I will return the task again. So it's a slightly different code, a slightly more, uh, more lines, but nothing that would be too difficult. Really, really uh, hidden one uh, is using the stream or stream reader, stream writer, not stream reader, stream reader doesn't have a flash, but stream or stream writer. So the first code is basically using stream writer to write something into the stream, you wrap it into the using block, which is correct. <coughs> Inside, you will use the array because you don't want to do blocking. And suddenly you realize that the 
code you have written is not scaling that well. The problem is that a lot of streams and a lot of stream writers uh, in .NET is actually buffering all the stuff that you have written to it, more or less. So if you call this post, it's actually implicitly going to do the flush and then the dispose. But the flush inside the dispose needs to be blocking, needs to be synchronous, because the dispose itself, at least not in C Sharp 8, uh, but all the previous version needs to be synchronous. So it's blocking in the dispose and it's kind of hidden because you don't see it. So if you have a all asynchronous path, you should explicitly manually call the flush async, the stream or stream writer has a flush async method that the, uh, the derived type can overload uh, and call the flush async with the event, so explicitly flushing it and then just disposing it, which might be like free the handle or something, something like that. Another one, uh, kind of callbacks. You have a heartbeat, a network monitor, something like that, so uh, I have a Heartbeat method is basically calling the, the backend API, doing something, whether it's alive or keeping it alive or something. Um, and I have a class that encapsulates this stuff. So I will create a new timer, uh, the timer from system threading. And um, again, sending the heartbeat one by one and not worrying about uh, timing out what's, what's happening with the timer, all this stuff. So, to better to do this stuff, because, well, I will go back. If you run the timer, it will run this async method and async void. So it, it will basically take a thread pool from, uh, it will, it will, uh, sorry, it will take thread from a thread pool, start the heartbeat, the heartbeat will immediately start the async method. Because it's void, there's nothing returning back. So whoever called it has nothing to hold to. And it will say, okay, well, the heartbeat method finished because there's void. Uh, it's still running. That's fine. Um, but it, that is free. So I have no idea what's happening there. The correct way or better way to do it is to wrap it um, into some async method that actually returns the task and assign the task to something. Assign because if you don't do it without, if you do it without the assignment, the compiler will give you a warning that you are starting a task and not assigning it. If you assign it to discard, then the compiler will say, well, probably okay. Um, and you know that this one is not actually like taking a thread pool thread, uh, doing something and uh, immediately jumping out, leaving the thread for other stuff. So always like hold to something, never ever do uh, the async void. The async void is only for um, even handlers in WPF, uh, in forums and all this stuff, because the signature of the method is given. It's always like void, uh, object sender, and some event arcs, so you cannot change it. So that's why the, the async void is supported. For a normal library that you're writing, the async void should never ever be there. Talking about the async void, uh, there's a one yeah, hidden, question. yes. Okay, so previous. Uh... Yes. It will be working without uh, a way to do async ping? Yes. Why? Well, because the, the do async ping method returns a task, the task will be discarded, and it's, it's fine. And uh, compiler doesn't uh, will make warning? No. I am calling do async ping without... Uh, without a way, without result, without anything. Yes, it, it's okay. going to work. Uh, if you remove the assignment, this one, uh, the compiler will give you a warning that you are starting a task and not doing anything with it, uh, which is okay for you because it's kind of like a heartbeat yeah. ping something. Uh, so you will just assign it to the variable that discarded, and the compiler yeah. will say, well, you assign it to something, I don't care, and that's it. It's assigned. You cannot do anything with it, but who cares? Mm -hmm. So from the same category is implicit async void. Uh, if you have like a background queue class that has a find and forget method that's taken an action. If you try the async uh, lambda or something on, in, in the middle, like find and forget async something away, uh, the compiler will not complain. Because you can say, well, okay, it's, a, it's an async void, which matches the signature of the action, 
uh, but you are in the same category. You have no idea what happened with the task. You just really did fire and forget. And even the background queue has no idea how to handle it. So if you want to support synchronous and asynchronous delegates and those callbacks, you should always have two overloads. The first one is with the action, and the second one is the funk of task. Uh, and the compiler will correctly uh, select the funk of task if there's an async await lambda uh, in it. It's kind of like hard coded that if you can decide between these two and it's a task and it's an async lambda or async something, use the one with the funk of task. Uh, and inside, obviously, you can do whatever you want inside the method fire and forget. And the final ish one uh, is the caching and asynchronous together. So you might say, well, okay, I need some kind of cache, so I will use the concurrent dictionary, which is correct because you will be probably accessing the cache from multiple, uh, multiple threads. Um, and there's a method get or add. It will either get you something from the cache if it's there. If it's not there, it will run the code. Uh, it's the second parameter. So the first one you would try is probably that's that's on the first two lines. You will call db. Let's say it's an entity framework, entity framework call db people dot uh, find async or to list async something like that dot result because you need to have some kind of result. So you will call dot result. So you know this is a blocking, that's fine. I have to somehow get the result. Uh, now you know that you might get an aggreg aggregate exception, which is kind of nasty. Uh, the hidden issue is that um, the concurrent dictionary uh, does not guarantee that the lambda, the, se the, the, the second argument uh, into the get or add, uh, can be actually executed multiple times. The lambda can be executed multiple times, but only one value will be stored in the dictionary, and this one will be provided then if you call get or get or add. So you will theoretically run it multiple times and even block on the on the result. So that's not good, uh, especially if it's really really expensive operation uh, to compute, like really getting something from the database, difficult store procedure, difficult view or something. You will be wasting a lot of resources, especially if the cache is empty and you are kind of warming it up. The better one might, might be, well, okay, well, I will just store the task. The task will be running on the background. Sooner or later, it will finish. Whoever gets uh, the data back can call the dot result uh, with the good intentions of like, okay, it's probably completed because the cache has been already populated or call await or something. Um, it's kind of okay, but you still have the same issue. The, the, the second uh, argument, the lambda, can be executed multiple times, so if the cache is called, the application is starting, and it's being hit by uh, the request, you will actually run the, the db.people.findAsync multiple times. Uh, in a worst case scenario, like killing the database, killing the backend API, or something, something like that. So to do it properly, uh, you have to actually kind of mix some things together. So I will still have the, the db.people.findAsync, that's still fine. Um, but I will wrap it into the lazy. Um, the reason why I'm wrapping it into the lazy is that I'm then accessing the dot value, which means it will materialize the lazy only once when I call the dot value. The lazy class allows you to actually provide a lambda, which is what I'm providing, and when you first access the dot value, it will get you either the cached value that was already computed or, or it will compute the value. And the lazy itself is just a class. It's just a regular class, nothing really specific. So even if the get or add is called uh, multiple times with the second lambda, you will just create a bunch of lazy. Only one lazy will be used. The one is a garbage, garbage code will, will uh, finish it. The first one will uh, call the dot value, which will compute uh, the, the database query, the fine async. And from now on, it's stored in the lazy and you can easily, easily use it. It looks weird, but it has uh, uh, the reason why it's written in this way. Obviously, um, writing it like new lazy something might not be the best case. Uh, probably deriving from lazy, having like like funk of lazy or lazy funk, lazy cache or something to give it a name would be better because now it's like, okay, it's just weird why I'm doing it. So that's all from the presentation. 
and let's have a quickly look um, into code. I have a pretty simple um, solution. It's bare metal ASP.NET Core application. There's one controller um, and I have four methods. I have a hello method that's basically waiting for two seconds and then returning hello world. Then I have the same one with the hello async. That's the last one that's using the task delay and using the await and then returns the hello world. And then I have sync over async and async over sync. Um, so we can actually check how this one behaves. Another small hack that I have is that in my program.cs, I'm creating a new thread that's in a loop every second going to uh, output number of requests currently running, number of threads, uh, minimum, maximum, and the threads currently, currently used. Uh, and the requests currently running, I'm simply using this inline middleware that I'm using interlock increment and decrement of a static variable on the program on the program class. Really like hard-coded stuff. Nothing that should be in a real code or anything like that. So, we can close this one. So, I can start the application and it says, okay, there's zero requests running, there's 32k available threads, zero active, Minimum is four because I have four CPUs and the maximum is obviously 32K. So I have the normal um, Apache Bench tool. It's not something that I've written myself or anything. If you, if you download HTTP or Apache web server, you have the AB tool, that's Apache Bench, that allows you to do a bunch of requests in concurrent. So I'm doing thousand requests, that's the first parameter, in thousand concurrent connections, that's the second one, and the, the K means keep alive. So it's not closing and opening the socket, it's actually hammering it really, really hard. And I will call uh, the hello method. So if we switch here, we will see I'm processing five, six, seven, eight requests, and I'm actually slowly, slowly eating the thread pool, and it's not really going that, that fast. You can see it. 16, 17, 18 requests, and these requests are running because it's decrementing when it's done. So now 22 requests are running and waiting for two seconds. Sooner or later we should see uh, it like kind of maybe going up and down uh, when there's a lot of threads. But I'm actually using all the available threads and every thread, um, at least in Windows, by default is using some kind of memory. By default, one megabyte, that's the, that's the stack, one point something megabytes, that's the user mode, kernel mode stack, and few stuff around. Um, so that's a lot of memory that's going to be eaten sooner or later. Now it's like 54, so it's 54 megabytes of memory. If I switch back to the uh, benchmark, you can see it's kind of running. Uh, and it took me, I don't know what time, but I was processing 16 requests per second. That's this number. That's kind of not much, right? Because it was a dummy MVC application and I was processing 16 requests per second, not much. And I was just two, um, two second uh, delay, two second call or something. So let's do the sync over async, which means I have a synchronous API, but somewhere higher I'm fully synchronous. So I will say, okay, well let's do sync over async. To clean up the thread pool, I will actually Oh, it recovered, but I will restart it anyway. We will see it's basically the same. I'm slowly eating the threads. I have a less and less available threads in the thread pool. There's a lot of active threads, a lot of requests happening, and it's not, it's not any faster. The benchmark itself is really, really slow. Uh, not even first 100 requests finished uh, because it's, it's writing, I think, by 100, uh, depending on the time. So we can leave it running for a couple of seconds. I don't know. Yeah, it even timed out because uh, the, the thread pool wasn't responding or something. Uh, it would be the same time, same throughput, because the sync over async is giving me nothing. It just async is down there, but I'm killing it 
on the on the top layer for some reason. What we can do is actually async over sync. We will say, okay, well, I will do async over sync. So I have synchronous API, but I wrap it into the asynchronous API. That must be better, right? So let's kill it. You can see it was still running and still running. Hopefully it will. Nope. Let's kill it. Is it this one? Probably. So back to the studio, async over sync. So I have synchronous API and I said, well, I will wrap it into the asynchronous method and I will have all the benefits of the asynchronous processing, right? So, well, not really, because it's still the same story. You st you're asynchronous from, from this point up, so the MVC and all this stuff can benefit from this. But on the bottom, you are still blocking the thread, you are still processing just a few requests and it's going to take, again, a couple of minutes, seconds to process all, uh, all this stuff. So I can kill this one, um, probably not this one. So let's do the same story. And finally, do just the async. I can start this one. No, I can because this one is not running, right? So it's going to fail badly once again. So as you can see, immediately I started processing 999 requests. All the 32K threads were available, active zero, minimum maximum was still the same. There's nothing uh, that's really uh, important about it. So now I was able to process um, 241 requests per second and only because there was not enough. So if I say, well, give me 100,000 and give me by, let's say 100,000, I don't know. What did I do? Ah, can only do 20,000. Oh, let's do 10, too. Let's do 10,000. The application still running? Yes, it is. So you can see one request, one, seven thousand, nine thousand, nine thousand, nine hundred nine, and that's it. Finished. Mm. And even the App Edge benchmark will say, okay, well, I was able to process almost two thousand requests per second. Just that. No memory. Good throughput. No threats. Nothing. In fact, uh, you would say, well, I've seen the Tech Empower benchmarks and all this stuff. There should be like way more than 2,000 requests per second being processed, right? Well, the problem is that I'm actually spinning the whole MVC and all this stuff. Uh, if I do like random URL, it will be even faster. So now I'm 7,000 requests per second, 7,000, almost 8,000 requests per second uh, on, on, on the localhost because there's no MVC, no routing, nothing. It just says, well, 404, I don't have, I don't have root for this one. And obviously you can do more requests that was too far. I think 20,000 was the maximum, right? So it's going to hammer the .NET core, the Castell even more. Uh, and then it's like, whoa, yeah. My machine basically says, well, not really. Uh, so 20,000 was probably not the correct one. Let's do just the 10,000 and hope for the best. Ah, yeah, we cannot see this one here because it's going to. And see? 11,000 requests per second. So unlimited scaling. Now it was just the, just the, the core of the .NET core. No pun intended. Um, and yeah, with the hello async, I can process any number of requests I want without blocking, without eating some memory or anything, anything like that. Just for fun, um, I can do just hello 
thousand, yeah, why not? And check the memory for the .NET process. Is it this one? Probably this. What happened? There it is. So, ah, it was my mistake. Let me quickly kill this one. Oh, yeah. The problem is that I have the, uh, the TCP IP tab open and it's trying to list all the, the requests coming. So it's kind of broken. All right, let's kill it again. So I will start it. We will see the .NET process here. Hopefully it's this one. I will check the performance graph, and this is a this is the memory being used. If I use the, the Apache Bench, we will see the memory slowly, hopefully slowly growing. It's not refreshing. What happened? Oh yeah, it's slowly growing. With every thread, there's more and more stuff happening. But I don't know why it's not refreshing. Maybe it's... Let me close this one for sure. And... Not sure whether this is going to work with Primo Desktop. Yeah, it's not refreshing for some reason. Or maybe it's already finished. Zoom it, you have to switch to Zoom it live. I have Zoom it live. Yeah. yeah. That's not refreshing fast enough mm. for some reason. Because this one is refreshing, but this one is not. I don't know. But we can see that the threads are growing. If it refreshes, now it's going down because it finished already. So the thread is cleaning the stuff. Maybe, yeah, it was too small, probably, uh, for the thousand. It was a small bump. I don't know whether you can see it um, of the memory because there was only 80 threads to process all the requests. If it would be longer than two seconds, not be able to process or more requests in parallel, it would be more memory usage. Uh, because of the threads being injected into the thread pool. All right, that's it. Questions and maybe answers. <laughs> the really bad question would be, why was the process explorer not refreshing? <laughs> Can you recap the thread pool starvation issue? Thread pool starvation issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, the thread pool has a limited number of threads. By default, in, uh, in this case, in the .NET Core, it's uh, 32K. So we have 32K threads available. So by default, uh, it's creating the same number of threads as the CPUs. Because the idea behind is, why would I create more threads than I have CPUs? Because I have five threads and four CPUs. What's the fifth thread going to, going to do? It needs to some context switching and all this stuff. So if you do some blocking and the thread pool detects that there is a blocking, uh, it actually adds a new thread. So we can see I have minimum four, activity zero, and if I do some, some blocking stuff, like the hello, we will see, okay, well, I have active six, seven, and more and more threads. If this starts refreshing, we'll see more than 20 again. Oh, I don't know why it's not refreshing, whatever. Um, so that means I'm creating actually on background more and more threads. And the problem is that first I'm creating the threads, and then the thread pool has a logic to create no more than one thread per 500 milliseconds. So basically two every second, and that's the minimum interval. It's not required that every second it will create a two, two threads. Uh, and at the end of the day, there's a, some, some limit. It might be 32K, it might be less, depends on the platform, on the settings, whatever. So sooner or later, you will either hit the limit or it will be too slow to, to add the threads. 
So right now I need, I don't know, like 1,000 requests in 1,000 concurrent connections. So, so it should be only two seconds because I have 1,000 requests open and I have 1,000 uh, connections. Um, what is that? Ah, it's got some kind of warning. Uh, and it's taking a lot of time. I don't know whether it's finished already. It did. And well, first the time per request was 56 seconds because it was injecting the threads. The, f the first four were already blocked. And together it took, there's a total time. Yeah, 56 seconds. Uh, yeah, it was probably one request that was waiting for everything. Uh, so it was a really, really long time. So that's the first, first one. The other one is that the thread pool itself is being shared for everything in, in, in the .NET, in, in the application itself. So if you are actually using all the threads that are available uh, from the thread pool, uh, it might happen that other stuff like the timer takes and all these different stuff that are using the thread pool uh, will not be able to get the thread from the thread pool and finish the operation. So for instance, uh, the IO completion port is using the thread pool as well. It's slightly different threads, but it's still the thread pool. So if you are using all the different IO completion port threads, that means all the requests uh, that basically you are starting uh, might be already finished, but you don't know that they are finished. They are, they are waiting in a queue for the callback to come to you and say, well, I'm done. This is the data. Do whatever you want with it. So the thread pool suddenly says, well, I have no more threads to to create because I'm full or either I'm creating the threads slowly. There is a method on the thread pool that uh, allows you to create more threads uh, that set the maximum and the minimum. Uh, that's really not what uh, one should do uh, because once you start adding more threads, that's like that's like the thread sleep. If you see thread sleep in the code, it's always bad. Um, but let's do the opposite. Uh, let's set the maximum to 100 and I will completion for threads to, I don't know, like 1,000. Not even 100, let's do 10. And if I start the application, if I start the application, what's happening? Oh, it's running in the background, right? There it is. So it gives me available 10, maximum 10. Request zero, so we can start hammering it. And if I do the same, we will see that sooner or later I will use all the available threads. So my application is now depending on the environment, either timing out or waiting in the queue. If it's in IIS, it's in the queue waiting, and the queue has a different length of time. Or it might just fail because, well, the guest rel or the whole ASP.NET has no resources to process the request so it will be failing or something ah oh, there was one finished and then again 10 requests running and uh, all 10 threads being used so if you have a really really huge application there might be actually like hundreds of threads being used that's kind of okay uh, i think in dotnet framework the limit on the on thread pool was 2000 uh, at least the, the recent versions uh, and again, if you are processing like 2,000 requests, you might use all the 2,000 um, threads and suddenly your application is unresponsive. It's not responding to new incoming requests or anything. So it's, it, it's fair. In .NET Core, the default is 32K. If you have 32K requests in flight, blocking the thread, well, then probably you have different issues than the thread pool itself. And it would be interesting to see who actually survived that long <laughs> eating all the threads uh, from the thread pool and still not dying or killing the application itself. But 32k concurrent requests, that would be a lot of lot of requests running. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. And it's still running. I can probably kill it, right? And it was four requests per second. Kind of sucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if that's it, then let's Thank you. let's drive to Austria or something. <laughs>